Good evening. You're watching The Big Story with Haryanto Duman. I'm Olivia Kwe. Subscribe to The Straits Times channel so you never miss a single episode. The People's Action Party has introduced a new candidate to replace Mr Ivan Lim, who withdrew his candidacy just days after he was unveiled by the party. Mr. Xie Yao Chuan, the head of healthcare redesign at Alexandria Hospital, will contest Jurong GRC in the coming general election on July 10th. The 35-year-old was introduced by Senior Minister Thaman Shamungaraganam, who said it was a very easy decision to field him in Jurong, as Mr. Xie has been here working very hard for the past five years and is known to residents and grassroots volunteers. And I've always been keen on Yao Chen because he was here, he was leading, and he's well regarded. My focus right now is to just continue serving the residents of Europe. Uh, I like to say that even though we have an election uh, going on, um, the needs of the resident don't stop. Right? Um, COVID 19 is still. Uh, the impact of COVID-19 is still, is still uh, playing out. Residents continue to have needs. The other candidates in the five-member team are Senior Parliamentary Secretary for Trade and Industry and Foreign Affairs, Tan Wu Meng, Ms. Rahayu Mahzam and another new face, Mr. Sean Huang. Mr. Lim pulled out on Saturday after receiving online criticism calling him arrogant and elitist for his past behaviour. Mr. Farman said the party will look into the matter after the election. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Lee Sen Lung said that PAP has confidence in its selection process and will not write candidates off without an investigation. He was responding to questions about Mr. Lim's withdrawal from the election. I think if we look for the perfect candidate, we will lose many good men and women. And if we encourage a culture of trial by internet, then we will not find anybody willing to stand and put themselves and their families through this ordeal, even if at the end of it, they're able to clear themselves. On the new PAP candidates, PM Lee said he's confident that several of them will become office holders in due course. He was speaking at a virtual press conference where he also announced PAP's Ang Mo Kyo GRC lineup. He will be joined by incumbent MPs Daryl David and Gan Tiam po, as well as new party candidates Ms Ng Ling Ling and Ms Nadia Samdin, who have been volunteering in the GRC. PM Lee added that the party will announce its plans later for the constituency's other incumbents, Dr Intan Azura Mokhtar and Mr Ang In Ki and Dr Ko Po Kun. Manpower Minister Josephine Teo will lead the PAP team contesting Jalan Besar GRC. The incumbent MP for Bishan Tuapayo went on a walkabout in the Bio Crescent Market and Food Centre earlier today. She was accompanied by Denise Pua and Hing Chi Hao, as well as new candidate Wan Rizal Wan Zakaria. Mrs. Teo is replacing Dr. Lili Neo, while Dr. Wan Rizal will be taking over from Dr. Yaakob Ibrahim. Both Dr. Neo and Dr. Yaakob are retiring from politics. I would uh, firstly like uh, to express um, our thanks to Dr. Yaakob Ibrahim and Dr. Lili Neo for their many years of faithful service uh, in Jalan Besar. I have experienced the very warm feelings that our residents have for both Dr. Yaakob Ibrahim and Dr. Lili Neo. They are very well loved and I think they will be missed very much by all our residents and they have also left us very big shoes and so the next team knows that this is a very high level of commitment that we must also continue to demonstrate. It will take time but I hope that we will, will be able to develop a relationship of mutual trust and support. Two new faces, meanwhile, will join the PAP team in Tanjung Paga GRC. They are Mr. Elvin Tan, LinkedIn's Asia-Pacific Head of Public Policy and Economics and former public servant Eric Chua. They replace Mr. Melvin Yong and Dr. Chia Shilu, respectively. 
PAP's Tanjung Park Slate will be helmed by Trade and Industry Minister Chan Chun Singh as well as Minister in the Prime Minister's Office in Johnny Raja. Ms. Joan Pereira is the fifth member of this lineup. Three-term MP engineer Dr. Lee Biwa announced her retirement from politics today. In a Facebook post, she said she's glad a much younger candidate has been fielded as part of party renewal process. Her replacement in the Nee Soon South Ward is a new candidate, Ms. Kerry Tan, the founding executive director of Charity Daughters of Tomorrow. Engineer Dr. Lee has served the ward for the last 14 years. And former Singaporean's first chief, Tan Ji Se, has asked to rejoin the Singapore Democratic Party following the dissolution of his party last week. He wrote on Facebook this morning that he had initiated contact with SDP leader Dr. Chi Sun Juan. If accepted, this would be the third time Mr. Tan has joined SDP. We're now joined by news editor Zakir Hussein to further discuss uh, the developments so far. Zakir, the Ivan Lim episode has been a talking point for the past few days. Even though it has somewhat ended with Mr Lim quitting and his replacement announced just this morning, how do you think this will affect voters? And will there be any long-term repercussions? I think those are quite um, two interesting questions. How will it affect voters? I think... Um, it depends. It's hard to say. I think it will affect the conf voters' confidence in the PAP selection process somewhat. Um, although the party has said that, um, you know, it will investigate uh, Ivan after the elections, but uh, Ivan himself withdrew as he felt that the issue was distracting from other core issues that should be addressed in this election. Um, as to how it would affect, uh, you know, have a longer-term impact, I think uh, PM Lee. Um, did allude to it when he said, you know, we can't just have this trial by internet, which was basically what happened to Ivan Lim. Uh, lots of angry netizens um, jumped on uh, some issues and basically, um, you know, made him dominate the headlines to an extent where having him, you know, where he, both Ivan and the party, I think, felt that having him on board would be detrimental um, to the party. Um, but at the same time, I think it could affect um, good candidates sort of wanting to step forward or wanting to even agreeing to enter politics. Um, and I think it's not just something in Singapore, but globally where candidates, you know, will have um, in their past dug up and friends and, um, you know, even former colleagues who may not like them, you know, uh, sling accusations. We've seen that happen to a couple of other candidates today, um, Sean Huang as well as Ng Ling Ling, and both of them have come out in recent days to address um, these accusations about them. Mm. Right. Well, also announced today, engineer Dr. Lee B. Wa's retirement from politics. So, Zakia, what would she be most remembered for, you think? I think uh, Dr. Lee has been quite a colourful, fiery character in, in Parliament, you know, raising uh, issues. Um, I remember she got chided once for uh, using a not so clean um, Hokkien phrase in, in, in um, Parliament once. Um, and she's picked up on her pet causes, you know, be it an overhead pedestrian bridge or, um, you know, um, people throwing sanitary pads down housing board flats. And I think those are some of her speeches that we remember. Um, and it's not just, you know, these aren't just um, things then. I think even recently during COVID when traditional medicine halls had to close, um, Dr. Lee put up quite an impassioned um, argument as to why these are essential services. And I think um, got that decision reconsidered uh, quite soon after. Mm. Now let's uh, focus on the opposition. Uh, Tanji Se dissolved his party last week and now wants to rejoin uh, SDP. Do you have any insights on what his plans are? Well, um, I think the, parties, the party and him have not announced that fully, but um, I'm expecting Dr. Tan to contest the, Mr. Tan to contest the election as a candidate for the SDP, um, whether it's for the Bukit Panjang single seats or the Marsling UT uh, GRC, we will see. Um, but SDP was the, v, was the party uh, Mr. Tan used when he first entered politics in 2011. So maybe he's coming full circle. Well, Zakia, nomination day is tomorrow when we will know for sure who is contesting where. What can we expect from tomorrow's proceedings and are we uh, likely to see uh, last minute changes? I think so. I think uh, there are several things to look out for. I think on the PAP side, um, it's, 
I think this is the first time in a number of elections that it's not finalized its key slates uh, till the last minute. You know, we're not clear who's standing in some of the single seats. We're not clear who's helming some of the significant GRCs, Pasiris Pungal GRC, um, East Coast GRC, and even Tempani's GRC. And I think there's a question mark over whether Senior Minister Teo Chi Hien, um, Deputy Prime Minister Heng Sui Kiet, um, or even Senior Ministers like Desmond Lee will actually um, you know, stand in the East Coast GRC, which is expected to be one uh, to watch. Likewise, the Workers' Party, although they've said the Aljunit slate will remain, we're not sure whether some of their leaders might make last-minute swaps and stand in Sengkang or East Coast GRC. And I think this is where both sides are sort of um, preparing to make their moves and adjust. And as we all know, um, with the election, nothing's final till the nominations are submitted tomorrow morning. Well, thank you so much, Zakir. Always a pleasure to speak with you. We were speaking to news editor Zakir Hussain on the latest developments in the general election. Zakir will be back tomorrow for the Straits Times special coverage of Nomination Day. You can catch the action on the ground with live streams from all nine nomination centres. Of course, uh, do join us live from 10.30am on our Facebook and YouTube pages. Now, at the same time, uh, remember to bookmark our GE 2020 microsite to follow our live blog and get all the latest election news. Moving on, the Progress Singapore Party unveiled its manifesto today with You Deserve Better as its campaign slogan for the election. The PSP manifesto outlines the party's vision for Singapore in three broad areas, economy, social and politics. Among the party's proposals are reducing the number of foreign workers, creating a stronger social safety net and cutting ministerial salaries. Other parties, including the People's Action Party and Workers' Party, also launched their party manifestos over the weekend. In a Facebook Live session last Saturday, Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong, who is PAP's Secretary General, unveiled the party's campaign slogan, Our Lives, Our Jobs, Our Future. PM Lee said given the COVID-19 pandemic, the central focus of the manifesto is how Singapore will work together to overcome this crisis of a generation. He added it also sets out PAP's longer-term plans to build a better Singapore post-COVID-19. Meanwhile, WP's slogan this election is Make Your Vote Count. The party's Secretary General Pritam Singh said the slogan was chosen because WP wanted to call into focus the need for checks and balances in Parliament. In its manifesto, WP proposed, among other things, scrapping the planned GST hike and implementing a national minimum wage. The party also devoted eight pages of the 39-page manifesto to responses to the COVID-19 crisis, proposing for the government to provide free vaccinations to all when one is available. The Elections Department said overseas voting for this GE will proceed after consulting with the Foreign and Health Ministries. The 10 stations are Beijing, Shanghai and Hong Kong, as well as Tokyo and the Australian capital of Canberra. There is also a voting station in Dubai and London and New York, San Francisco and Washington in the US. However, this is subject to the approval of the overseas authorities and the prevailing COVID-19 situation in these cities. Now details on the voting procedures will be sent to registered overseas voters after nomination day tomorrow. Here's an update on the COVID-19 situation here. 202 new cases were confirmed today, taking Singapore's total to over 43,600. They include six community cases, four are Singaporeans or permanent residents, and two are work pass holders. The majority of the other cases are migrant workers living in dormitories. Now more details will be released later. Well, in other news, around 3,300 staff, residents and clients of various homes, shelters and centres will be tested for COVID-19 from this Wednesday, July the 1st. They include people from voluntary children's homes, crisis shelters and children's disability homes, as well as staff engaged for community services for people with disabilities. From July, the Ministry of Social and Family Development will also conduct fortnightly sample tests on all staff and residents of facilities serving seniors to monitor their health. 
At least four people have died of dengue this month. This means that as at June 23rd, 16 people have died of disease this year. The health ministry said that the people who died were between 49 and 82 years old. 14 of them worked or lived in active dengue clusters. Dengue infections continue to surge, topping 1,000 a week for three straight weeks. While the COVID-19 pandemic has wreaked havoc in some areas, it has put e-learning on the fast lane in Singapore. This is something Education Minister Ong Yi Kang brought up in his annual work plan seminar speech to school leaders, as well as during an exclusive interview with the Straits Times last week. Mr Ong explained how the move to home-based learning during the circuit breaker prompted the Education Ministry to bring forward the National Literary Programme. Now here are the highlights. Many other countries had already shut schools immediately once the infection mm. started, the infection cases started to rise. Uh, now on hindsight, how do you feel about the decision you made at, you made at the time? The, the, worry, the worry of parents, uh, most understandable. Mm -hmm. The reaction, the responses of countries uh, are also understandable. I, I can imagine places in Europe or, or America where they have been dealing with seasonal flu and seasonal flu do affect children more and children become a vector for transmission. So to them, in their, in their rule book, actually schools are one of the first places to close. On hindsight, there were a lot of calls, petitions sent to me every day. Mm. <laughs> On hindsight, I'm glad we didn't close schools. Yeah, and because of a few things. One of the key reasons was um, the findings and, and evidence coming from other countries, particularly China, mm. that the effects and that the virus can infect children but to a lesser extent. And uh, the effects on children are also lesser. And those were the initial evidence coming out of China. Today, nobody argues about that anymore. Mm. I think the evidence is all over the world now. And so on that basis, if we take enough precautions, we can save the school year. Because the downside of closing school is tremendous. Yeah. Uh, so today you look at the facts. Um, touch wood, we still don't have a school-based transmission. Mm -hmm. we don't have, I hope we can keep it that way, although it may be hard if COVID is going to be around for a couple of years. But we'll try our best. Uh, school, uh, school students who are infected either get it overseas or they get it from home. Uh, a few are unlinked still, but we have not registered one from school. So I think it's possible with the right measures, we can keep school safe while allowing lessons and learning to continue in the physical environment. Has the pandemic shown us uh, what is the upside of online learning, the advantages to be gained? Uh, and about making it part and parcel of the education that students receive. Yeah, so we will make home-based learning part and parcel, maybe once a fortnight for mm -hmm. secondary school, mm -hmm. uh, primary school too. Um, can start with that. Um, but that is a formality, right? Online learning, you, you use yeah. the word online education, but like there's right. a certain formality that is right. formal classes. Right. But online Learning is already a reality. You can deny that it's not there, only classroom. It's not. We right. learn so much right. from the internet, from Googling, from just right. finding out information. So it's just that reality already surpassed us. Mm. So sooner or later, the formal education system will have to adapt it, uh, accept it and embrace it. And we have done so through SLS, and we had some plans to have a national digital literacy program. Right. So again, it's one of these things where the pandemic accelerated that whole process and helped us open up a bit more perspective to say, actually, we can do more no? or do better. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's why we are planning on this integrating home-based learning into the formal curriculum. I think it's quite worthwhile. You ask what is the, mm. what is the benefit? Yeah. If I simplify, it's just one, just one, independent learning. Okay. Yeah, because you're on your own, no peer pressure, no classmates mm -hmm. 
teacher is away, you're on your own. They may be online as a resource, especially the teacher, but you're pretty much exercising independent, curiosity-driven learning. And it, if you do it frequently enough, I believe you, we, have a more we have a higher chance of inculcating that as a habit in our children because they will need that habit for the rest of their life. What about the other gaps that this pandemic has yeah. kind of exposed so, and yeah, so there are what many. must be done about but it? But I think digital divide is one, mm -hmm. financial divide is another, financial literacy divide is another. Mm -hmm. Financial inclusion is right. also a problem mm -hmm. alongside with digital inclusion, right. yeah. which is why we quite quickly review this situation with MSF right. and MAS. MAS right. uh, is extremely supportive and we say, try to catch all the students. Right. Um, most, most majority actually have their own bank account by the time they reach primary school, okay. but 30% don't. So we thought for this 30%, many of whom are lower income, have a safety net to catch mm. them. So that's why the idea came about, came from one of our officers, that mm. we always have a child development account yeah. As, we, as we set up the CDA, give them a CSA, a child savings account. Right. Automatic, you can opt out. You can opt okay. out. And it can come with pay now, sing pass, all the things that you need for digital inclusion. Right. That was MAS's great idea, which I thought mm. was great. Yeah. Okay. So I think we, we will try to operationalize it. So okay. I think we are looking at, not too long from now, mm -hmm. all P1 pupils will all have a bank account. And I think we then have to couple it with financial literacy lessons. Right. Because so far we teach uh, savings and spending within budget through paper money. You see. In future, it's all on digital, so you must right. be able to look at digits and monitor right. my bank balance. So you're going to announce um, this interdisciplinary causes um, that universities are going to look into providing um, actually, the schools have already been doing joint degrees, double degrees, um, kind of, you know, interdisciplinary in nature. So what, what is it? How is this different? I think that it's a worldwide trend going on for some time because mm -hmm. of the realisation of the pace of change. Right. Yeah. So therefore, lifelong learning is needed right, to keep up with the pace of change. But lifelong learning is needed. But lifelong learning needs to be supported. Mm -hmm. We talk about school mm -hmm. and how children need to have independent learning as a lifelong skill. So likewise, at the tertiary level, we assume they already have those skills, independent mm -hmm. learning. So what right. they need is more versatility, a stronger, broader foundation. Because if lifelong learning is like building a tower up, mm -hmm. the higher you want to build it, the stronger your foundation needs to be. Yeah. And lifelong learning now necessitates that. Yeah. So more interdisciplinary learning is enough, far more than what we have today. But what would you say to people who will say that you're making students um, jack of all trades and master of none? Mm, that is, if you think your learning stops there. If your learning stops there, yeah, you're jack of all trades, master of none. Because your learning cannot stop there. Mm. That is only the start, that's the foundation. Then you build up your tower, you have to then figure out what do you want to specialize in. Then you may have to do a, a grad cert, a grad diploma, or master's, mm -hmm. or just certificate courses that deepen what you know. I did a story recently mm -hmm. on the second admissions exercise. Uh, quite a number of them were students who were heading overseas for first year studies. And because of the pandemic and the disruptions, uh, a lot of them still don't know whether their mm. universities will open for on-campus learning. Um, <clears throat> so they've, they have basically applied for local universities. So do you see uh, MOE providing more places uh, in the university this year? If we really have a situation where students that were going overseas decide to not do so and yet they meet the admission criteria, mm -hmm. yes, we have to increase the okay. number of places, even if it means uh, going beyond 40%, because the basis of 40% take into account of students going overseas. 
right? Yeah. And now they yeah. are studying here. Actually, yeah. is the outcome is the same. Right. I, I don't know the outcome yet okay. uh, because many of these students who are going overseas, they will apply to local AUs anyway. Right. And they often accept anyway. Mm. Yeah. And then later, they will think about which overseas university they want to and then they give up their seat and they go. Right. So right. I think we have not seen them making that decision yet. Right. So it's uh, only when they matriculate. Right? Yeah. I think when they matriculate them or right. closer to matriculation, they probably will then make a decision. Right. So at that point in time, if we need to add more places, but provided they meet admission criteria, that, yes, that we course. have to. Uh, yeah. If we need to, I think we have to increase. We will increase. That was Education Minister Ong Yi Kang in an exclusive interview with the Straits Times senior education correspondent Sandra Davy, And you can, of course, watch the full interview on our YouTube channel. In the global headlines today, COVID-19 deaths have topped 500,000 worldwide as infections surge past the 10 million mark to remind us that the pandemic is stronger than ever. The startling number of global cases is a rebuff to health experts and world leaders, some of whom had earlier hoped that the virus would win in the summer heat. Instead, infections are multiplying, especially in areas resistant to safe distancing measures. It took four months for global cases to reach one million since COVID-19 first surfaced in Wuhan. The current spread compresses the time frame to a million additional cases every week. Russian bounties offered to Taliban militants in Afghanistan to kill US or UK troops there are believed to have resulted in the deaths of multiple US troops. According to military and intelligence officials, U.S. intelligence officers and special operations forces were alerted to this suspected ploy as early as January. Four Americans were killed in combat in early 2020, but the Taliban have not attacked U.S. positions since an agreement in February to end the long-running war in Afghanistan. The New York Times had reported last week that U.S. President Donald Trump was briefed on the intelligence findings that Russians had tried to bribe Taliban fighters to kill U.S. troops. But Mr. Trump has repeatedly denied receiving such a briefing. And Starbucks will suspend advertising on all social media platforms as it explores the best ways to help stop the spread of hate speech. This following in the footsteps of other global brands like Coca-Cola and Unilever. However, Starbucks' social media pause will not include YouTube. It comes after controversy over Facebook's approach to moderating content on its platform, seen by many as being too hands-off. Well, it's nomination day tomorrow and The Straits Times will have a special show covering all the proceedings at the nine nomination centres. It will be on Facebook and YouTube and you can tune in from 10.30am. For all the developments, you can also head to this GE2020 microsite and remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. Once again, I'm Harianto Diman with Olivia Kuei. Join us tomorrow for more stories on A Big Story.